Okay, how are you, Alison? I'm fine, thank you. Oh. Enjoying the sunshine. Oh, thank you yeah. so much for coming on again this week. And the, it was so useful, but lots of people missed it. So anyway, I've got hundreds of questions for you. And one of the main questions is, how do you, how can you gauge or judge a good embryo? What makes you select one to, to put back? And where does technology come in as well? Right, okay, so um, it's, it's improved over the last few years, the way that we assess embryos in the IVF lab um, and got much more technologically advanced, fortunately. Yeah. So traditionally, we would normally, we'd look down the microscope and um, subjectively assess the embryos based really on the number of cells they've got, how smooth and even those cells are, um, and whether or not they've got any fragmentation, patients may have heard about um, fragmentation. So little bits of cytoplasm, bits of cell that have broken off. Um, generally not a great sign of uh, embryo, good embryo quality. So that's the traditional way of assessing embryos. And it is effective. But now we can use much more sophisticated tools. Okay. So what do you, what do you use to sort of increase success? Well, if you imagine... Um, in standard IVF, we will open the incubator to take the dish very carefully out, to look down the microscope at the embryos, usually up to once a day. Well, now we can use time-lapse imaging, which is taking a photograph of the embryos developing every five to 10 minutes throughout the whole period that we've got them in our care in the IVF lab. So we use all of that information to help us gauge the embryo quality. So this is now, it's called morphokinetic morphology which is the traditional way they look yeah and kinetics kinetics the way they move the, the behaviors that they're they're making so adding those two things together with this time lapse imaging we can assess the whole journey it's like a live feed really of the embryo's development so we've gained so much more knowledge um, and experience on how to gauge the quality of the embryos now by this time lapse imaging that we use so you're able to choose then which you feel are the best to go back yeah, well, what's happened really, it's been a, a very exciting journey. And I'd say that Care Fertility have been leading the way with this. Mm -hmm. um, so probably eight or nine years ago, we started collecting these images using the Embryoscope, which is one of the time-lapse incubators that's available. And then we'd go back and look at the data that we'd collected because we knew that we'd transferred this number of embryos um, and they'd resulted in a baby and another group of embryos we transferred in good faith because they appeared to be beautiful, yeah. but they hadn't, they hadn't made a baby. So we got data analysts to look at this data to say, well, what's the difference? Is there a difference between these two sets of embryos? And there was. So we've developed care maps, which is um, algorithms that help us choose much more objectively which embryos are the good quality ones, you know, whether they appear to be or not. We know Does that give you a greater success? Yes, it's definitely. Yeah. We've um, we published a lot of our work about this and across the um, the field, lots of peer reviewed journals and a textbook as well. Um, and it's hard to say a particular um, uplift in pregnancy yes. rate because every patient's different. But in general, the average uplift is around twenty percent. So that's a relative increase. So from forty percent to fifty percent, not twenty percentage points. So certainly, I mean, any uplift is worth having, and that's a yeah. significant improvement. So it's yeah. um, it's been an amazing journey, really. Fantastic. And what about male fertility? Apart from ICSI, what other technology can you use to to help men with poor sperm? Uh, well, we've got um, we've got all sorts of tools in um, in our toolbox, um, but ICSI is a phenomenal technique really um, it yeah. overcomes that physical barrier between um, the egg and the sperm because we take the sperm and inject it right into the middle of the egg. Um, IMSI is a technique that um, some people... Um, Somebody's asked about but, IMSI yeah. Yeah um, and this is a very high magnification method of choosing the sperm so again this is looking at morphology of the sperm. It's not necessarily telling us too much about the, um, the DNA of the sperm, um, but it's looking at the shape of the sperm because the sperm shape can be associated with its, um, its potential to fertilize. Um, we've also got um, quite a new 
um, solution that we can use to get the sperm moving. It sort of kickstarts them. It's caffeine related, really, chemically. Yeah. Um, for, for men whose sperm are non-motile, it's really difficult for the embryologists to choose to inject. We can still inject them into the egg, but some of the non-motile sperm will be alive, potentially, and some can get the sperm that are actually alive and just still moving and that's all we need is a little twitch we know it's it's alive and then we inject it into the sperm so when um, we're doing some preliminary work with that and what's that called it's called called sperm mobile okay sperm <laughs> great name where do they think of these from I know. I, know. I know somebody's just asked as well that are miscarriages more common with ICSI um, well, not not in our hands. No, we've not noticed an increase in miscarriage rates with ICSI compared with IVF. Um, it, it's difficult. You can see all different reports and it's very much patient related. Yeah. But, you know, great advocate of ICSI and it's a phenomenal procedure. Yeah. And often, well, in our hands, we wouldn't offer ICSI unless it's absolutely necessary. If And it's generally based because of sperm numbers. It's generally male factor treatment. Um Whereas some clinics in the US will do 100% ICSI. They yeah. would say, well, let's just not risk a failed fertilization with conventional IVF and inject the sperm straight into the egg. Um, at Care Fertility, we'll only do ICSI when it's indicated. Yeah. They're asking, are there any downsides to ICSI? Um, well, it's, it's a less established technique. I mean, it's very well established, 20 yeah. years or so, but it's not as well established as IVF which is yeah. going much longer um, and you can imagine it's not quite as natural as IVF because in IVF we've just mixed the eggs with a suspension of sperm and one sperm will bind the one that makes it will do the fertilizing whereas with ICSI we're selecting the sperm yeah so um, it's not quite as natural and um, there were some reports of um, slightly higher increase in um, neonatal abnormalities with ICSI and um, some of these studies have been um, dismissed some of them have been criticized yeah but often there was always in our hands there's a male factor contributor which is why we're doing ICSI so there can be other um, other issues associated with it so it's not as simple as uh, just comparing like yeah. with like they're completely different treatments and indicated for different reasons yeah. i think a lot of women worry as well don't they if their men have got poor morphology that it's going to be um it's going to have have an abnormal baby or, or whatever and that's not the case either no not at all and the the sperm is just carrying that important dna um it needs to be motile in a natural environment not doesn't necessarily in in the ivf lab um but no they shouldn't worry about that Alison, can I also ask you, a lot of people are asking about A and B grading of embryos. Do they always offer a better chance? And can you just explain that grading? Yeah, and again, there are different grading schemes, um, but every IVF lab will try to select between a group of embryos when they're faced with a group of embryos. They want to give the patient the best chance as soon as possible. So they will pick the embryo um, based on their own grading scheme. And there are several common ones yeah. used across the world. Um, and we'll choose the best one first. So A in this example would be better than B, would be better than C, would be better than D. And, and these grading schemes are based on evidence and data. Yeah. So um, A we should be better and will be better in terms of implantation rates than B and C and D. But um, saying all of that, um, it's not black and white. Yeah. So we can still get healthy, gorgeous babies with grade D or C embryos. Um, not quite as high a rate as the A's or B's necessarily. Um, but we have to talk to each patient about what we're faced with, why we're choosing the embryo we're choosing. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not everything. It's, it, you can imagine you're looking at the embryo and it's um, a grade A, but that's telling us just about how it's appearing at that time point. Two hours ago, it could look completely different. And in another hour or two, same story. Cause they go and that's where the, the embryoscope comes in, presumably. Exactly. It makes yeah. a big difference. Um, and the morphology of the mor morphokinetics of the embryo isn't necessarily going to be reflective of its DNA content or its chromosome copy number. So we can see with our genetic testing treatments that sometimes magnificent looking embryos that you yeah. would put on the cover of a magazine <laughs> 
have uh, the wrong number of chromosomes, so they're abnormal, they can't be transferred. So it's, um, it's a complex field, but um, we're certainly um, gathering information all the time and fine tuning our practice to give the best results. Yeah, Christina here is asking that she's not been told what her grade her embryos are. Is there any reason for that? Is that just a communication? Um, well, most clinics would um, would certainly discuss. Yeah, because there's always a conversation, isn't there, going on between the embryologist and the patient? Yeah, there should be. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, we're moving. We're moving more based on the knowledge that we've gained from time lapse. We've been able to fine tune our standard practice because not yeah. everybody has the time lapse. Um, and so what we're learning is let's not take those embryos out of the incubator unless we really feel confident we're going to get some important information from them. Let's not just take them out to make an assessment to tick a box. So it could be that this lady who's uh, messaged in is, is having treatment in a clinic where they're not making regular observations. So they're not grading the embryos until the very end point, which is actually the time that it matters when you're ranking them when you're choosing them yeah yeah i understand right i've got some questions here i'm going to go through so this lady's had four ivf cycles and a frozen cycle she's um managed to collect nine they've managed to collect nine to 18 eggs and fertilization rate is good but the majority of the embryos always seem to drop to poor quality um, resulting just at one blastocyst on day five um, I've recently had AOA. Do you want to explain what AOA is? Um, PGT, uh, PGT, but the result was the same. One viable, uh, viable embryo. Please can Alison talk through the grading system and do poor embryos ever make it to a viable blastocyst? Oh, right. Well, yes. Um, starting at the end, yes. Sometimes very poor looking embryos can make it to um, a viable blastocyst and, and a baby. Yeah. So wouldn't give up hope um, but there are different things that we can do so the um, AOA is artificial oocyte activation so this can be used to um, to help fertilization so this is done right at the first stage normally um, to help with fertilization for patients who may have had a failed fertilization with ICSI in particular um, well, well this is good timing actually because We've recently, based on some uh, information and, um, and personal communication with a great scientist in Austria, we've been able to use AOA for poor blastocyst development. Oh, really? Not, yeah. So um, we use it very cautiously because it's not, um, it's not really for this purpose, but there is some evidence and we've li liaised with the regulator to let them know our rationale for offering this um, mm -hmm. cautiously. Um, so that's fine, and we're gathering information, and patients are very well informed. But yes, um, it seems that it can help for patients who've had um, poor blastocyst development and meet certain criteria. If we do it at the same time, so we immerse the eggs in this solution um, to open the calcium channels and really get them going, and we can then see much, much improved blastocyst quality when we've done that so maybe this patient's had this treatment for blastocyst development but um, generally it is for, for fertilization okay and can healthy people babies being born from low-grade mosaics have you seen this can you see that yeah oh yes yeah uh, yes yes babies could be born from low-grade mosaics so we haven't really talked so much about um pre-implantation genetic testing yeah. for if you can that would be great so people can yeah. understand if they don't understand what this so um, i'll try and keep it really simple because it it, it can be confusing but um, yeah. quite uh, in simple terms we need um a chromosome from the egg and a chromosome from the sperm um 23 copies we need the right copy number so we've got a pair of each now in um in humans aneuploidy which is an irregular number of chromosomes is strangely quite a common phenomenon and it's one of the greatest causes of miscarriage so um, in recent years we've been able to take a few cells from the embryo usually at the blastocyst stage which is about day five or six when the embryo has over 100 cells it can easily spare a few we'll take a few cells and we send them off to the genetics testing lab and there they will count the number of chromosomes and they'll report back to us based on the, each embryo's unique identifying number, yes. which embryo has the right number of chromosomes and which ones don't. So sometimes we'll get a report which says it's mosaic. So it may have 
just a part of an extra chromosome, not a whole copy again, but just a little bit extra. Um, and these cause us some confusion and we don't really know the implications of this. So mosaicism is generally graded as um, high level or low level. Um, and the literature from around the world, um, increasing in number all the time, would suggest that embryos with low level mosaicism have a reasonable chance of resulting in a healthy life birth, whereas high level, much less chance. So yes, we can achieve pregnancies and births with mosaic embryos, um, but each mosaicism is different. We yeah, don't it must be very scary for, for, a, yeah. for a couple to make that decision to have it put back, mustn't it? Exactly, yeah. yes. So, it's yeah. tricky. so in terms of PGMT, Who's it suitable for? Because presumably you have to have a good crop of embryos to be able to, to, to do it. And I think some of the older women it seems to be quite suitable for if they have that. Yes. Um, generally, we will recommend it for women over 37 years old. Yeah. Because we know that the instance of this aneuploidy is more common in advanced maternal age. Saying that, some um, women who have just one embryo and they're age 42, they'll say, I would like to have it tested because I just want to avoid um, a painful two-week wait or the risk of a miscarriage of an aneuploid pregnancy. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely a personal thing. Other patients will say, I've only got one embryo. I was intending to have it tested, but I want to give it a chance. Um, I'll, I'll take whatever happens. So it, it is a personal thing, but um, we would be recommending it in advanced maternal age or in patients who may have had um, recurrent miscarriage or yeah. recurrent implantation failure. Lots of transfers um, and no success is often a, a good indication to try the genetic testing. Okay. Um, another lady now, she's 39, AMH of 106, tested in 2018. Um, I've had four rounds of IVF since um, in January 2019. Uh, one overstimulation produced around 40 to 50 follicles and 14 to 20 mature eggs on collection. Only two rounds resulted in fertilized eggs blastocyst. Two cycles unexpectedly failed. I get I had OHSS, so which is hyperstimulation. So we had to do a freeze all. Two frozen embryo transfers failed. Had 17 eggs, six blastocysts, grade A, but PGS testing, only one was normal and one low mosaic. mosaic. RFET for the one normal was cancelled with the lockdown, um, which is a real shame, isn't it? I'm worried about having such a high number of abnormal embryos. Um, what can I do for future success? Which is difficult because those embryos have been made now, so she's waiting to have them put back. Yeah. Um... Oh, but presumably you'll be getting, I mean, what's hard is to give medical advice here because it's difficult to know which clinic um, this lady's going to. So it's probably better to have a discussion with her clinic unless you feel there's something you can add yeah. here, Alison. Well, I think a general comment really to say that, um, you know, I always try to be the positive in every situation. Um, it sounds like there is a euploid embryo. There's a normal embryo. It's safe. Yeah. It's in the cryobank, it's not going anywhere, it's not deteriorating. Um, and it was created when the patient was younger, somewhat yeah. younger. So it doesn't matter in terms of the chances that the patient's getting older because that embryo is in suspended animation and the chance is all related, the chance of success is all re always related to the age of the egg at the time yes. inseminated. So um, let's pin our hopes on that one. And um, but in terms of aneuploidy, if that's what's happening in that patient's embryos, then it, it will just be a matter of repeating cycles, I would say. Um, maybe the medical team can try and change the stimulation protocol and maybe something they could do that could um, improve the euploidy rate. And that's what, that's what we were saying um, the other day, that every step of the way with IVF is important. To me, in terms of the preparation with nutrition and lifestyle, then the protocol you're on, the tests and blood tests you have going through, egg collection, transfer, and, and um, the lab work, all of it is, is, is key. Um, another question here, and this gets asked a lot, does, does a day three embryo have the same chances as five day blastocyst? Um, no, the, the best chance of success is with a blastocyst transfer. 
Yeah. And, but we need to remember that, that that blastocyst, that successful blastocyst, was an embryo on day three. And yeah. had we transferred it then, the chances are it may well have done it. The, the benefit of um, day five transfer is that we have longer to assess the embryos. Yeah. So if, if they're going to fail on day three or day four or five, then they will have failed. So we're selecting between a, a more viable or potentially stronger population when we're looking down the microscope on day five. And also um, when we transfer on day five, the synchronicity is better. So by that, I mean... That's the, that's the signal in the uterus and, you know, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. that window of implantation. Exactly, because if, if the people conceiving naturally, the embryo will only arrive in the uterus to, to meet the endometrium at around the blastocyst stage. Yeah. So if we transfer an embryo on day three, it has to sit and wait for a couple of days because the endometrium is not receptive, it's not ready. So um, it wouldn't normally be sat in the endometrium, it would be traveling its way down the tube. So in some ways, the synchronicity, well, in many ways, the synchronicity is better, so the environment should be better. So if we um, have... Yeah, sorry. I'll just say, if we have excellent um, incubators and culture systems in our IVF labs, then I would say, personally, the embryo is better to wait there so we can assess it more and transfer when the time is uh, more optimised on day five. Okay. Another question that's come in is, can the stimulation protocol affect egg quality? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, it can do. And um, we're always having a chat with our clinical colleagues because in the IVF lab, what we want is um, great quality gametes. So by that, I mean eggs and sperm. And um, the stimulation protocol, um, the timing of the trigger, the HCG trigger, can make a difference in terms of the number and the quality of eggs that we receive in the lab. Yeah, okay. Um, more questions here. Um... What have I got here? I'm 42. My husband is 47. We had our first round of ICSI in March, but sadly, two from nine eggs didn't make it to day six. Um, so our specialist has given us a 15% chance of success in this cycle and sl said it would be slightly less in the future. Um, we're prepared to fail, but what do you think realistic the chances of success are? It's a bit of a strange um, thing to say, isn't it, about 15% chance of success it is, but that's probably a, a probably around what i would estimate as well it based on the age of the female yeah so age 42 with your own eggs then the chances are going to be around 15 percent, i would say um so it's again it's a personal choice if you want to uh, keep trying there is a chance there yeah um, so some couples would turn to egg donation in this situation, or um, certainly if the success rates were lower than that, um, where we get 50% success in general with um, donor eggs at the age of females 42. Yeah, okay. There's another couple of questions that come in and they're repeated in what I've got here. Does endometriosis affect egg quality? The second one I've got here, having candida, can that affect egg quality? And the third one is, if I get the coronavirus, is that going to affect my egg quality or frozen embryo transfer? Oh, right. Not there. Um, the thing about eggs is they they've been they've been in the female body since birth. Yeah. Um, so whether all these different factors can have an impact, we're not entirely sure, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know enough about COVID nineteen to say really anything about the impact on pregnancy, on yeah. egg quality. Um, we just don't have the answers to that. Um, and things like endometriosis could, could in theory, affect egg quality. Um, but there's not a huge amount that we can do to overcome that because it's there. Yeah, yeah. So we have to deal with what we've got and do the best we can with the, the eggs and the sperm that we, we're given in the lab. Yeah. Uh, somebody's just had chemotherapy here and she sort of said, will it affect her eggs forever? I mean, presumably she would have had some frozen, I would have thought. You may well have. I think it depends on which, um, which chemotherapy, which, which drugs have been administered yeah. as yeah. to the impact or the severity of the impact. I think some of them seem not to be um, toxic at all to the eggs and others seem to be um, highly toxic. So it will depend very much on, on what treatment's been undertaken. But... Certainly, um, many patients do have eggs frozen yeah. prior to therapy. 
Okay, so does egg quality, um, is it related to AM, AMH? Yes, uh, well, yeah, and egg number as well. Is yeah, related to yes, that's the, and age. More, and, uh, yeah, they're all yeah. interconnected. They, they are tightly connected. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, this lady here, she had um, three failed ICSIs between 2016 and 19. In July um, 2019, she became pregnant with twins. Sadly, ended in a double ectopic. Oh, no tubes remaining. We've had failed pixie cycle in February, and my AMH is 14.1. I turned 40 in June. Um, what are my chances of it working? My husband's sperm is poor as well. Um, it's. <laughs> I don't, so I don't difficult, know. It? It's difficult to say exactly what the chances are. Um, if we can get eggs and embryos, then there's a chance. Yeah. So it, the best thing is really to, um, to have a review consultation, to go through all of the information, what's gone on so far, um, and consider the options and the associated chances um, based on your clinic's data and experience, I would say, is the best yeah. advice. It's, it's a tricky one. Yeah, I can see there's lots of AMH questions coming up and I'm going to be covering AMH next week because the level of AMH is dependent on your age and a reference range when you have a test. But I will cover that. Um, there's another question here about um, DNA fragmentation of sperm. How useful do you feel that is for you know, a man with poor morphology or, or whatever? Um, I think it's very it's very interesting and it's very real and it's important. Yeah. Um, it's hard for us to do much about it um, by the time the patient comes for treatment. So it's something that happens really upstream of the IVF lab. Yeah. The, te the test for it, um, any lifestyle changes which may have a positive impact. If it gets to the point of treatment, um, we can't get a precise result on the DNA fragmentation. Yeah. Um, and, and even if we could have, there's not a huge amount we can do because we need to get the eggs inseminated. Saying that, um, there is some evidence to suggest that ICSI might be better um, for patients with DNA fragmentation in the sperm yeah. than I compared with IVF. Um, because but I think that's where it's quite useful, isn't it? Because somebody that might be doing IVF, if they f feel that, you know, they get a result back about high DNA frag, they'd go straight to ICSI as opposed to doing IVF. So that's quite helpful. I always find it an expensive test to do, and then you have to repeat it. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a it difficult one. Yeah. Okay, coming to the end now. I'm 40, managed to get five embryos, and was devastated when there was no fertilization. Why can this happen? Um, well, we're not sure if that is IVF or ICSI. Um, yeah. I mean, it, with IVF, we can see failed fertilization for various reasons, um, such as the sperm morphology is so poor. Um, yeah. The acrosome, the, the the head of the sperm can't bind properly to the zona, to the shell of the um, of the egg to get through and fertilize. So there could be some sort of physical barrier or some receptivity type um, issues, which can almost always be overcome with ICSI where we just take a fine pipette and inject yeah. the sperm straight into the middle of the egg. Saying that sometimes we do also see um, fertilization failure with ICSI but it is pretty rare um, so something like artificial oocyte activation could help with this um, and we could also look at the timing of the insemination because it might be that although the egg appears to be mature um, so it's it's genetics it's um extruded its polar body so it looks to be mature but it might yeah. still be undergoing some cytoplasmic maturation it might not be quite ready so we can look at the timing of uh, things to just make to increase the chances in these sorts of cases okay lisa i think your question's been answered about ICSI by somebody else and alison was talking about it as well what's the difference between ICSI and pixi does one have a higher success rate um, well, PIXI is, um, is a method to select sperm based on their maturity um, and it seems to be correlated with the DNA integrity. So it's a special, specialised 
culture dish. So the sperm bind to little patches of hyaluronin. And if they bind to those patches, then that's an indicator that they have the maturity required to give us a good rate of fertilization. Yeah. So um, the studies so far show that there may be some patients that benefit, but it doesn't seem to be generically applicable for everybody. So um, yeah, the jury's out a little bit with that one. Okay, is it more advanced than MC? Um, yeah, yeah, I'd say so. I would consider it more advanced. It's more, um, it's more of a function test than, than the IMSI, IMSI, which is just a morphological assessment. So it's yeah. more looking at the function. Can the sperm bind to these patches? Yeah. Okay. So finally, we're, we're winding up now. Um, a lot of women are worried because they've got frozen embryo transfers. And so there's two questions here. What's happening to their embryos? Um, while this lockdown is going on are they all safe and the second one is what about thawing how many do you expect to lose when you um thaw an embryo in our cryo labs the factory just went low for a moment yeah in our cryo labs um, all our frozen embryos and frozen sperm and eggs are completely safe as safe as they've ever been um, we have embryologists on site regularly monitoring them they are, the dewars, these tanks, these vacuum flasks where the embryos are stored under liquid nitrogen are continuously monitored. So they're alarmed. They're, we're measuring the temperature in there and the level of liquid nitrogen. So they're really safe. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, and the success to... rate with frozen embryos is, is good. Oh, yes. So, yeah, I'd say it's as good as fresh embryos. And... Um, the, the post-thaw survival rate, for us anyway, last year was 98.5%. So almost all embryos will survive the freeze-thaw process, which is quite phenomenal. Yeah. Um, something we would never expected um, if we were our te 10 years younger, when we used to do a slow pro programmed freezing um, process, um, we were, weren't getting success rates anywhere near that. And now with vitrification, this fast method, we're getting almost 99% survival. Well, maybe you'd come on and talk another time about egg freezing, because that's quite a popular question that I'm getting through here as well for a lot of uh, women, single women. Um, OK, and then the final question, Alison, the million dollar question. When do you think we'll be up and running? Huh. Well, I'm forever the optimist. Yeah. I think um, I'm hopeful that we'll start to see some restrictions being lifted over the next month or so. Yeah. And um, at least be able to start planning treatments. I imagine we might start with frozen embryo transfers sooner than fresh, yeah. just, just because of the slightly higher risks associated with um, an egg collection and the burden, potential burden on the NHS. Um, but I think if I was a patient, I'd start to think about the next steps, yeah. um, have a consultation, at least have a plan. Yeah, plan um, of action is really important. Is, is yeah. really important, and that's what I'm trying to get through with this this course yeah. that I'm doing. 